Revelation chapter 8, we will be looking at verses, just verses 2 through 5 this morning. Revelation chapter 8. But before we look at the text, let me ask you a couple questions. Do your prayers really matter? Maybe a better question is, do you ever wonder if your prayers really matter? You know, one of the songs we sang uh, just a few minutes ago kind of alluded to that. Sometimes we have doubts. Sometimes we wonder if God hears us, God sees us. Another question for you as a church body, are our prayer meetings on Sunday evenings really that big of a deal? And do they really change anything and have any impact on what happens in the world? John Franklin recounts a time in June of 1990 when he joined about 250 people to participate in a two-week evangelistic crusade in, a, in Mombasa, Kenya, which at the time had a population of around a million people. By the way, our brother Jim Leslie is home. Way back us, Jim. Way back in the back. Jim just spent a month in Madagascar and Burundi, Africa, and God moved in uh, amazing ways that we'll hear about hopefully real soon. And we're so glad you're home. We've been praying in, in, your, in your time away. So there John Franklin is in this, doing this evangelistic, uh, two-week evangelistic thing in Kenya. They were divided into teams of three, each team going hut to hut and house to house presenting the gospel. Franklin said that he was in awe. A few times in my life I've been in a service or a prayer meeting where the manifest presence of God could be felt, but never before in a whole city. Wherever we walked, the presence of the Lord tangibly permeated the land, so much so that often people were saved by the dozens. Franklin goes on to tell one example when his team of three was walking down a dirt road that led to the next village. Up ahead were three Kenyan men seated on stools by the roadside. As we approached, he said, one of them arose, walked briskly toward us, and greeted us in English. Excuse me, are you from America? He asked. Yes. Are you one of the ones who has come here to tell us the word of God? Yes. We've heard that you came, and we've heard of Jesus and his great power. Tell me, how does one become his follower? My friends and I want to know. John explained the gospel, and without a trace of hesitation, the man immediately replied, let's pray. John Franklin thought, what I would have probably thought, well, that was way too easy, he must not have understood, so he began to repeat the gospel again. But the man interrupted and said, I understood it the first time. Let's pray. That story of people coming to, to them to be saved happened over and over, Franklin says. In all, 30,000 people responded to the gospel in 14 days. It was an extraordinary 14 days for Franklin and the team, but the, but you cannot miss the whole point of this story is to tell you the, the next story, the back story. Three months earlier, several churches in Mombasa began fervently praying for these two weeks that were coming up of evangelism. During the two weeks of the crusade, a different church prayed all night each night. John Franklin joined one of the all-night prayer meetings praying until 7 a.m., when he went to bed, he woke up four hours later and felt the presence of God in his hotel room so strongly that he did not rise. He simply slid out of the sheets to his knees in prayer. That day, following that prayer meeting, John said every single adult they witnessed to trusted Christ. Franklin and the others in the crusade made a big discovery in that time. The revival that came to this city happened because of the prayer meetings of God's people. And so church history is replete with the same over and over and over again. Indeed, someone has said God has never worked in a powerful, mighty way, a way that goes down in history except that his people were praying. You see, your prayers, my prayers, and our prayers prayed together in prayer meeting on Sunday evening absolutely matter to God. And they matter in his work in the world. We continue this, this, this morning our study in the book of Revelation. 
We've entitled the study, Seeing Your Reigning and Returning King. That's the point of the book of Revelation. It's not the point to get bogged down in all the whys and wherefores and whens things are going to happen and all of that. The point is that we come away seeing that today Jesus reigns and that today Jesus could return. Because that reality changes everything. This morning I want to talk to you from Revelation chapter 8 verses 2 through 5 about our prayers, the course of history, and the return of Christ. Our prayers, the course of history, and the return of Christ. The truth I want you to take home is this. Our prayers shape the course of history and bring the return of Christ. Now you say, Chad, I thought God was sovereign. I thought God did whatever he wants to do in this world. I thought he did things according to his plan from beginning to end. Yes, indeed he does. And yet he has chosen to work through human agency, through our prayers, and somehow in the sovereignty of God, it all goes together, and just as real as the fact that God moves history, He does it through a praying people. Our prayers shape the course of history and bring the return of Christ. Now, that last phrase we'll get to at the very end. You're not going to see the return of Christ in what we're about to read. We'll get there at the end of the message. You ready? Revelation 8, verse 2. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God... And seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. These few verses teach us this simple truth. Our prayers change the course of history. They shape the course of history. The scene is painted here in Revelation 8. It's, it, it, it's a scene, a, a picture of our prayers and incense being offered on the heavenly altar of incense in the presence of God as a pleasing aroma to Him that moves Him to answer our prayers with His fiery work on the earth, symbolized by the angel throwing the fiery censer, the fire from the censer to the earth. There's two main points I want you to see from these verses. And then we'll look at some points of application. Number one, in verses 3 and 4, every Christ-exalting prayer is heard and kept by God. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, verse 3, and he was given much incense to offer with with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Every Christ-exalting prayer is heard and kept by God. Leon Morris has said that the saints of God, you and me, believers around the world, especially I think of the persecuted church today, they are insignificant to men at large. We as believers are seen as insignificant to men at large, but in the sight of God, we matter. He loves us. And when we pray, every Christ-exalting prayer is heard and kept by God. Now, I said Christ-exalting prayer. You and I have prayed a lot of self-exalting prayers. Hello, y'all with me? We've prayed a lot of selfish prayers. We've prayed a lot of prayers based on our wisdom, not God's wisdom. Based on our desires and will, not the will of God. So to clarify that, God is not your genie in the bottle who you get to rub a a lamp and get three wishes and, and, and just ask for whatever. He is God. And in as much as we pray Christ exalting prayers according to the word, then he hears and keeps those prayers. We've already seen this, haven't we? Early in Revelation, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. It says, of the Lamb, that when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, listen to this, and golden bowls full of incense, which are 
the prayers of the saints. Every time that you and I, by the grace of God and by the Spirit of God, pray a Christ-exalting prayer, it goes to heaven and is put in a bowl that the elders hold, a golden bowl. It is incense before our Father. Let me make sure we're communicating. (laughs) I just told you that every time you talk to God, He takes that conversation and puts it in a bowl. Is that not the most precious thing you've ever heard in your life? Your father takes your words and stores them away. He takes your prayers and puts them in a bowl. Why don't I pray more? Why wouldn't I pray more? Let's just get this over with. Why wouldn't this be a prayer meeting on a Sunday night? Hello, are you okay? I hope not because you shouldn't be. We've even heard the cries of the martyrs from under the altar of God. Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And here's how they continued to pray. There in heaven, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. You see, every Christ-exalting prayer is heard and kept by God. We see this vision of the angel. He's there before the altar of incense. And he offers incense along with the prayers of the saints up to God, which is what we come to discuss next in verse 5. Not only will every Christ-exalting prayer be kept, is it heard and kept by God, it will be answered by God. Number 2, verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So the angel first offers our prayers along with incense on the altar of God. Uh, I I just believe, again, we got symbolic images going on here. Because of the the verse we read back in chapter 5, I believe the incense, I mean, that's what he says back in chapter 5. Incense was the prayers of the saints. And so he makes this offering. It says smoke rises in, uh, before, the, before the throne of God, before the, uh, the, the Lord himself. And, and, and the idea is God is breathing in this sweet-smelling, pleasant aroma. It satisfies him. It's pleasing to him, the, the fragrance of our prayers. He hears them. He keeps them. He is pleased by our prayers that exalt Christ. But then he answers our prayers. The angel takes the censer, fills it with fire from the altar, and throws it onto the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, I want to start at the end of that verse and work our way back to its beginning. The end of verse 5 says, And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. We sang some of these words a minute ago. I don't know if you caught that, but we sang some of those words a few minutes ago. And we've seen these occurrences before. Back in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, there in the throne room of the one who sits on the throne, it says, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Now, it's important to notice what's going on in that chapter. Very simply, we are seeing the one who sits on the throne. That's what the whole chapter is about. Chapter 4. Chapter 5 is about the Lamb who stands before the throne. But in chapter 4, it's, it's a picture of the glory of the Father. And there, the description is given of, of sort of the, the ongoing state of what's happening on the throne. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a There was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. These things, that is, 
the flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, the earthquake as described in Revelation 8. These things indicate, if nothing else, and at, at, at its most basic level, the presence and power and activity of God the Father, the one who sits on the throne. And here in Revelation 8, verse 5, they indicate that the action of the angel in throwing fire from the altar of incense onto the earth comes at the sovereign initiative of the Father. It is in answer to the prayers of the saints. Every Christ-exalting prayer will be answered by God. God is moving. God the Father was moving this angel to take the fire from the altar and to throw it onto the earth. And he made that clear by the manifest, his manifest presence in, as described in the peals of thunder and the lightning and the, and the earthquake. Now later we'll see that those same natural occurrences, flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, earthquake, we'll see them in, in, with reference specifically to his judgment. And we'll see that in later passages. Now, <clears throat> The seven trumpets that are about to be blown are going to reveal to us how it is that God is working in history today, how He will continue to work in the days leading up to the return of Christ, and the certainty that indeed Christ will return. You remember what we said, saw in verse 2, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And so those guys are just standing there. All while what we've been discussing in verses 3 through 5 is taking place. They're standing with their trumpets ready to blow them. But before they're blown, the scene we've been in is occurring. This incense had to be offered. Our prayers had to had to be seen to rise before God, to be pleasing to Him, to be heard and kept by Him, and then to be answered by Him even as the fire is cast on the earth. You see, God wants to make sure that John and you, that John and me, are crystal clear on this reality that our prayers shape the course of history. If you take time to go back and look, what you'll notice, and you'll see it as we go forward as well, we're seeing something here that we saw in the seals. Do you remember before the seals began to be opened, we had, we had two chapters, chapter 4 describing God the Father who's seated on the throne, who was holding the scroll. Then in chapter 5, we had the description of the Lamb, the only one worthy to take the scroll and begin to open it, right? And so seven seals. Before you get to the seven seals, you have... Sort of the impetus, the catalyst that makes that whole section roll. You, you with me? There's got to be somebody worthy to open the seals. It was Jesus. We're fixing to look at the seven trumpets. But before we hear the trumpets blow, there's got to be something that causes them to blow. Hear what I'm saying to you. Your prayers move the trumpets. Your prayers move heaven to cause the trumpets to blow. Your prayers are involved in the course of history. Our prayers shape the course of history. Now, we're going to work through the seven trumpets in the next few weeks. But I want to fast forward to the seventh trumpet for just a minute. Number one, just because I can and because it's so good. And it is our blessed hope. And you remember what I said at the beginning? Our prayers shape the course of history and bring the return of Christ. Well, this is that bring the return of Christ part. In Revelation 11, verse 15, it says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. 
and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, that's me and you, by the way, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. As we've seen, all of this is an answer to the prayers of the saints at the hand of our God. Our prayers bring the return of Christ. His return to judge those who oppose Him and to reward those of us who trust Him and love Him. So what do we need to do in response to Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 through 5 this morning and until Jesus comes? Five things for you to take home. Jot these down. Let me just give it to you in one word first of all. Any guesses? Pray. My Now you know what I thought y'all had fallen asleep. I thought y'all were missing a lot. I, th- I thought you were just checked out. Y'all smart. I got a good class, Miss Pam. They are, they, are, they are checked, tuned in. Five ways for you to pray. Number one, pray always and with persistence. That's what Jesus said when he was here in Luke 18, verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. In verse 8 of that same chapter, after the parable of the persistent widow is told, it says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Do you remember the story? Jesus tells a story about this widow who would not leave the judge alone. I mean, she was up at his house at night, knocking on his door, wanting to get a judgment. She couldn't get on the docket during the day. She wanted to get a judgment. I mean, she just was relentless. And finally... The unjust judge, he wasn't even a good guy. He's like, man, not because I'm a good guy and not because I give a rip about this lady, but bottom line is I need some sleep. And because she won't quit knocking on my door and hollering at me through the window to come settle her case, I'm just going to get up and do it because then I can sleep. And Jesus said, "If, if a judge can be worn down by that kind of persistence. A guy who doesn't even care. He's not even a good judge. Will not the judge of all the earth, will not our Father who is good, who loves you, he's not unjust. He doesn't do it to get you off his back. He loves you. Will he not listen? Will he not hear? Will he not answer your prayers? And Jesus said, the reason I'm telling you this, John says, the reason, um, um, who? Luke says, the reason I'm telling you this story, the reason Jesus told this parable is so that you would always pray and not lose heart. How many of you have ever lost heart in prayer? (laughs) It's just the day for the prayer sermon, okay? Just is. We're there, we came to it. Our prayer meetings look like you've lost heart in prayer, Estella J. He hears you. He wants to hear your voice as you cry out to Him. And I know you pray at home. I know, and and, and those same prayers go into the same bowl. You don't get a bigger bowl just if you you come to prayer meeting on Sunday night. That's not my point. It's just very simple. The people of God have always prayed together. and, And when the people of God really want God to move, that's what they do. When they get desperate, that's what they do. I'll just, hey, hey I'll, I'll take it. There's an election this week. Let me tell you what's more powerful than your vote. Your prayers. So if you believe it, I'll see you at six. Pray always and with persistence. Secondly, pray even when you don't know how to pray. Ever been there? Romans 8, 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and He who, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now let me tell you what that, those two verses do not mean. They do not mean, look, Spirit does your praying for you, don't worry about it. You don't know what to pray for anyway, so just don't pray. The Spirit will pray for you. That's not the idea. 
We're to cry out to Him. That's so clear all over Scripture. We're to cry out to Him. But when we don't know exactly how to pray, it's okay. Do the best you can. Talk to Him. Search His Word to figure out what His will could possibly be in a given situation. I'm not talking about whether you go left or right. I'm talking, you understand what I'm talking about. It's more will. How to pray according to the Word. But then pray. And say, God... I thank you that the Spirit's going to take this. And if I've messed up, I, I, don't, I want to pray in sync with your will. I don't want to ask for what I want. I don't want to ask for what the world says is the way to go. I want your will because I know you're good. I know you're wise. And so if this isn't right, thank you that your Spirit's going to fix that for me. That's what those verses mean. Pray even when you don't know how to pray. Thirdly, pray for the eternal fruit of souls saved through your witness. John 15, verse 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. We like that last part. Whatever I ask in the Father's name, he'll give it to me. So all I got to do is say in, the, in, in, in Jesus' name, in the Father's name, if I just kind of tack that on, then, then Jesus said, I mean, and we start running with this name it, claim it, you know, Baptize it with Jesus' name kind of prayer and pray whatever we want to pray and ask for whatever we want to ask for, but it's not what the point is. In the context, Jesus said, I chose you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I set you apart. I appointed you to go and bear fruit. What kind of fruit? Spiritual fruit. Not money. Not status and human position. Spiritual fruit. Souls for the kingdom of God. And so what is he saying? That's the plan. That's my will. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Let me just tell you where you're going to see power in your life happen when you get your prayers in line with the will of God. And the will of God is that you, God would use you to bring people to him. If you really want to see God answer prayer, start praying for opportunities to witness and be serious about it and be ready for his answer. And they'll come. They'll come. And all of a sudden, in that moment, <laughs> if you're not ready, you'll probably freak out a time or two. It'll probably catch you off guard a time or two because you're not, we're not used to that sometimes. But then, as we grow, God will give us words. God will give you the words you need. He did in the law office a couple weeks ago, as we discussed on a Wednesday night. He did it more than once in Madagascar and Burundi, Africa, when Jim was in a completely different culture and didn't have every, just everything prepared that he needed to say in that moment. And he'll do it for you. Fourthly, pray for all things to be made right by the just judgment of God. Remember how the martyrs pray in Revelation 6, verse 10? They cry out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? We're to be praying for men, women, boys, and girls to come to Jesus, and we do. If you join us tonight, we pray by name for people that you know and love who need Jesus. We ask God to save them. Some of these people we've prayed for by name almost every Sunday night now for over two or three years. A long time. And we're going to keep doing it until he comes or they get saved. And we've seen God answer on a few occasions. Those people we've named on Sunday nights, God's, God saved them. A few of them. And we're going to keep praying that way. But what this prayer is about is God, in the end, make all things right. In the end, avenge the blood of the, of the martyrs. Avenge your name. Show the world how good and right and true you are. And judge those who've reject, who, who chose to continue to reject Christ up until the point of Christ's coming. There's always room for repentance until He comes. He always stands with his arms open until the day of his return. But on that day, here's the thing. 
you're going to see some things when we get into the seven trumpets that are going to be disturbing. You're going to see God unleashing demonic powers to torment those who do not have the mark of God. That is the seal of the Holy Spirit. And they're described viciously. And it'll bother you when we get there because it, it just kind of should. But here's the flip side. It ought not bother us as much as it bothers us that men, women, boys, and girls, even me and you on occasion and in our past, have blasphemed the holy name of the one who loved us enough to give his son to die for us. And that men, women, boys, and girls continue to reject the only Lamb of God who can take away the sins of the world. You see, we want a just and holy God who punishes sins. We want a just and holy God who makes wrongs right because that's the only that's the only true God it's the only way he could be holy and so we can pray to that end finally pray for the return of Christ hello Paul did in 1 Corinthians 16 22 it says if anyone has no love for the Lord let him be accursed our Lord Come. It sounds a whole lot like Revelation 22, verse 20, where John says, He who testifies to these things says, that is Jesus, Surely I am coming soon. And here's John's response. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Do you pray that way? Do you pray for the return of Christ? Our prayers shape the course of history and bring the return of Christ. Revelation 8, verses 2 through 5 teaches this. One commentator says this as we close. The fire comes from the very altar on which the prayers of the saints have been offered. This surely means that the prayers of God's people play a necessary part in ushering in the judgments of God. What are the real master powers behind the world? And what are the deeper secrets of our destiny? Here is the astonishing answer. The prayers of the saints and the fire of God. That means that more potent, more powerful than all the dark and mighty powers let loose in the world, more powerful than anything else is the power of prayer set ablaze by the fire of God and cast upon the earth. Do you want to be part of that? Man, I do. I can't, I can't believe we get to be a part of that. But our prayers shape the course of history and bring the return of Christ.